Good afternoon. My name is Stephen Limbaugh, Jr. I'm from Cape Girardeau. As part of our Missouri Bicentennial, I would like to tell you about the life and times of Judge John Dillard Cook. He was one of the first three judges of the Missouri Supreme Court. In Cape Girardeau, in the old Larmer Cemetery, on a beautiful, splendid bluff overlooking the Mississippi River, John Dillard Cook is buried alongside his wife, Sarah, his daughter, Juliet, their son-in-law, and several other family members. You see, uh, Judge Cook lived in Cape Girardeau County for the last 29 or 30 years of his life. As a result, this presentation, my remarks are kind of parochial. They pertain to Southeast Missouri and Cape Girardeau. But in fact, Judge Cook, as one of the first pioneer judges, uh, his story is representative of most of the pioneer judges in Missouri, and indeed uh, his story is, is more high profile than most of the other pioneer judges. John Dillard Cook was born in June of 1789 in Orange County, Virginia. He and his family moved to the area around Frankfort, Kentucky about uh, the time he was seven or eight years old. And it was there in Frankfort, Kentucky that he grew into manhood, he completed his education, decided to go to law school, except there were no law schools at the time. So he wanted to be a lawyer, which then meant he had to read law. Nearly all of the lawyers, most of the lawyers, I should say, uh, west of the East Coast, read law instead of had formal law school training. So John Dillard Cook, at a young age, uh, took an apprenticeship. That is what it would mean to uh, read law, an apprenticeship, a mentorship with an established, well-established, well-regarded, seasoned lawyer over the course of a couple of years. And he would study law under the tutelage of that per uh, person. Then after the two-year period or so, uh, Judge Cook, or then budding lawyer Cook, would sit before a circuit judge and take a bar examination, an oral bar examination. And if he was successful, he then became a lawyer. It was simple as that. In 1814, uh, Judge Cook married. And he and his wife, within a year, decided to migrate to St. Genevieve, Missouri. This was at the end of the War of 1812. And there was a huge influx of settlers from Kentucky and Tennessee and Virginia and North Carolina and so forth coming over into the new Missouri Territory. Uh, this was at the end of the war and the political problems had subsided and it was safe to go there. They settled in St. Genevieve, Missouri, which was a thriving place at the time. One of the historians has said that there were maybe just a couple of dozen lawyers in all of the Missouri Territory in 1815. So the place was ripe for a person like John Dillard Cook, a new budding lawyer with a family. And so he and his wife, they started a family, um, he uh, started his law career, and he even started to dabble in politics. He was so successful at it that in 1818, just three years after he had arrived in St. Genevieve, he was elected uh, to the Territorial Council as a Territorial Senator. That was the equivalent of uh, what a state senator would be today. He was successful at that as well, as and not only as a politician, while you're building up his practice. So in 1820, at the time when uh, the Missouri Compromise had come into place and Missouri had been conditionally admitted to the, the Union, uh, he was elected as one of the 41 delegates to the Missouri uh, Constitutional Convention to draft a constitution for Missouri. It was said that he was uh, a genial, had a genial wit and a pleasing uh, personality, but above all, he had an uncommon fund of common sense. And so this young 30-year-old lawyer was kind of a natural to be participating in the Constitutional Convention. As I said, there were 41 delegates um, to the Constitutional Convention, which was held in downtown St. Louis. To be a delegate, to be elected delegate, uh, you had to be pro-slavery, and that's not exactly the right term. You had to be rather uh, against regulations on slavery. Uh, all people recognize the evil of slavery, but the fact is uh, we had so many slaves already and slaveholders 
in Missouri that it was uh, untenable that Missouri was not going to be admitted to the Union as a uh, slave state. It, this was such an overwhelming uh, group, uh, overwhelming pro-slavery group that when the elections were taken for the delegates to the Constitutional Convention, if you were anti-slavery, you didn't have much of a chance. Let me tell you about Cape Girardeau County, for example. They were allotted four delegates to the Constitutional Convention. There were nine candidates. Only one of the nine candidates was anti-slavery, someone who wanted Missouri to come in as a free state. He finished dead last. That's just how it was. And so uh, John Dillard Cook was elected from St. Genevieve County as one of their four delegates. Uh, he was not necessarily pro-slavery, but even more so than the slavery issue, there was the concern that none of these new Missourians, these immigrants from all over what had been the uh, United States proper, and now they were in the Louisiana Territory and the Missouri Territory, they didn't want the federal government telling them what to do. Our executive director, Gary uh, Kramer, gives a stock speech about the bicentennial. And one of the things he says was that even before Missouri was admitted, formally admitted as a state, there was a large faction of the citizenry that wanted to succeed from the Union. That's just how it was. So there were nine lawyers out of the 41 members of the delegation to the Constitutional Convention. And as a lawyer, each of those people had a bit more participation and an outsized influence because of their special skills, especially so with John Dillard Cook. One historian uh, uh, credits him with, as being one of the six principal authors of the Missouri Constitution of 1820. The eminent Missouri historian, Floyd Shoemaker, said that he is one of the fathers of the Missouri Constitution. The Constitution was finally adopted on June 19th in 1820. Uh, one of John Dillard Cook's principal duties was to be the head of the committee of three to draft the judicial article that set out the powers of the state judiciary. So the way they did that was to set up four judicial districts. Uh, we call them circuits now, uh, geographically located. Now we have 46 judicial circuits. Back then they set up four districts, and in each district they would have two sessions or terms of court annually. There was a Supreme Court of three judges who would hear cases two times a year in each of the uh, the circuits or the districts, and then there were circuit judges who would hear the trials in those respective uh, circuits over the course of several terms during, during the year. Now, the way of judicial selection that John uh, Cook wrote in the Constitution was the equivalent to what the federal system was. The chief executive officer, the president of the United States, appoints federal judges subject to the advice and consent of the Senate. We all know that. Well, that's how they did it originally in 1820. The governor of the state of Missouri appointed all judges, Supreme Court judges and circuit judges. Their appointments, like the federal judges, are for life. Uh, there were two provisos, one that you had to hold office during good behavior. I'll get to that in a minute. The other was that uh, the judge had to be at least 30 years old and mandatory retirement at age 65. Now, Judge Cook but, well, by, by the way, too, that system has changed. That was our original system in Missouri, exactly like the federal system. In 1851, as a part of Jacksonian democracy, the, the uh, populace got fed up with the governor appointing all the judges. And so from 1851 until 1940, the judges in Missouri were popularly elected on Republican or Democrat ballots or whatever a political party they affiliated with. Only in 1940 did the Missouri Nonpartisan Court Plan come into play. So going back to the Article V constitutional provision, the judicial power, uh, Judge Cook also wrote in very cleverly uh, a sentence that said that the compensation for Supreme Court judges was to be, quote, not less than $2,000 annually, which was a handsome sum at the time. As it turned out, within two years, one of the first amendments to the 1820 Constitution was to take away the uh, 
compensation provision and give the legislature the authority to set the compensation for judges and forthwith the legislature reduced that $2,000 annual salary to $1,400. There was an outrage over it, needless to say, but he got away with it in the first place in 1820. Let me uh, step aside and tell you a bit about John Dillard Cook's two brothers. The first was Nathaniel, both prominent people. Nathaniel was 14 or 15 years older than John Dillard Cook. He came over from Frankfort, Kentucky, where their family uh, had their um, plantation-like holdings. They were planters, they called themselves. He came over to St. Genevieve way early, about 1800, before the Louisiana Purchase. He made his way into what is now St. Francis County and established a settlement in southeastern St. Francis County. And eventually, uh, right after the uh, Louisiana Purchase, he was an, appointed as a government land surveyor. And he used that position to parlay uh, real estate development. I'll just put it that way. He became a wealthy man. Uh, he then migrated down to what's now Madison County and the 40 acres that constitutes the downtown Fredericktown, Missouri, the county seat of uh, Fredericktown, of, of Madison County. That was all the property of Nathaniel Cook, John Dillard Cook's brother. Now, he also served in the War of 1812, first in the local militia, but he worked his way up to uh, uh, a colonel, and he led a regiment in combat, and so after the war, he was a hot commodity. He was highly respected, a wealthy man through his real estate ventures already, and in 1815, he was elected to the Territorial Senate, just as his brother was uh, three years later in uh, St. Genevieve. And to be sure, Nathaniel Cook was also elected to the Constitutional Convention of 1820, sitting side by side with his brother as the two of the 41 delegates. The other brother was Daniel Pope Cook. You've heard about this person. Daniel Pope Cook was also a lawyer. He had that affable quality like his brother, uh, John Dillard Cook, but he never made it to Missouri. He settled in Kaskaskia, Illinois. Very successful as a lawyer there. And so much so that in 1818, when Illinois became a state, and Kaskaskia, I didn't know this before, Kaskaskia was the first uh, state capital of Illinois. But he was from Kaskaskia, and he was elected as the first representative to the United States Congress from the, state, the new state of Illinois in 1818. He had an illustrious career. I won't go into the details, except to say that, uh, unfortunately, he died early, but his career was uh, marvelous. One interesting thing I found is a long extended speech that Daniel Pope gave on the floor of the United States House of Representatives in February of 1820 in which he lambasted Missouri's application to come into the Union as a slave state. Illinois was free state, of course. He felt so strongly about this that he even called out his own two brothers for their pro-slaveholdery holder uh, position on Missouri's admission. Now, I told you, you've heard of Daniel Pope Cook because you know about Cook County, Illinois. Chicago, named after Daniel Pope Cook, John Dillard Cook's brother. So let's go back to the Constitutional Convention then. The spoils of serving on the Constitutional Convention, at least for the lawyers, is that you could get a judicial appointment. And that's what happened with John Dillard Cook. The Constitution uh, came into play in June of uh, 1820 at, before statehood was formalized on August 10th of 1821. And so it operated as kind of a territorial government until 1821 in August when it converted over to the legitimate state government. But in any event, the first governor of Missouri, Alexander McNair, appointed three judges just as John Dillard Cook had written in Article 5, the judicial power of the Constitution. The first one was John Rice Jones. He was 20 years older than John Dillard Cook. He was in his early 50s at the time. He had been to law school at one of the East Coast top-end law schools. He was very prominent, very wealthy. He was a delegate to the convention and very highly respected 
but he served only uh, until 1824 when he died in office. Then the next appointee was a fellow with this marvelous name, Matthias McGurk. He served for the next 20 years as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He was from uh, Montgomery County. John Rice Jones was from Washington County. Matthias McGurk and John Dillard Cook were both 31 years old at the time. John Dillard Cook served only two and a half years. The speculation is still today uh, about why he would resign from that wonderful high position, historic position. There's speculation that he just was not a city person. He liked a more of a bucolic lifestyle, to be out in the countryside, he was a lover of nature and woods and streams and so forth. At first glance, you would say, well, he must have been no good. That's not correct. He was highly regarded as both being uh, very competent in, in the work that he did in, during that two and a half years on the court. Uh, it was written that he had ability, poise, and eloquence of diction. He wrote 26 opinions. Let me call your attention to just one of those opinions. It was the case of Bailey versus Gentry in 1822. It was a replevin case. A replevin case is one in which the plaintiff seeks the recovery of property that was unlawfully taken by, uh, from him or her by some other party, some other person. The challenge in this case was to the constitutionality of the new replevin statute that had just been enacted by the legislature. And so John Dillard Cook wrote the principal opinion for the court declaring the statute unconstitutional on a variety of procedural grounds. But the real import of the case was this was the first case in which the Missouri Supreme Court adopted the doctrine of judicial review. That is the inherent authority of a Supreme Court to declare a statute enacted by the legislature constitutional or unconstitutional, citing the seminal case from John Marshall of Marbury versus Madison, the inherent power of the court to declare statutes unconstitutional. That was a big part of that. That, that was the whole case, really. That, a sad aside, interesting aside, the object of the replevin action, the return of the property unlawfully taken, was a slave. So John Dillard Cook tired of his two and a half years on the Supreme Court and he moved to Cape Girardeau County and set up a law practice in Jackson, Missouri. He ran unsuccessfully for the uh, state representative, but he was uh, popular, successful. He had a good law practice going. The circuit judge there had also been a member of the Constitutional Convention. His name was Judge Richard Thomas, and he presided over the entire circuit that covered basically all of Southeast Missouri at the time, from St. Genevieve County all the way down to the Arkansas border and all the way west as far as any settlements uh, were there. The problem, though, is that in 1824, Judge Thomas got in trouble. Remember, I told you that provision that he could hold office during good behavior. He got himself impeached. First person ever to be impeached. In 1825, he was actually removed from office. I have found... a delightful book called Reminiscences of the Bench and Bar of Missouri. It was written in 1878. This is a glossy reprint of the one original I found in the Supreme Court Library that's in tatters. Fortunately, I have this, and it was written by a circuit judge himself drawing on the recollections of all the old pioneer judges. This was 1878, a generation away from the pioneer judges. But the anecdotes and the many biographies in this book are just wonderful. Uh, they're effusive and they're uh, embellished both for good and for bad. And the way they wrote back then was often in the most unflattering terms, even talking about people's appearances, so forth, as a practice of the writers at the time. But so, so, so here is what uh, the writer said about Richard Thomas, the fellow who just got impeached, the circuit judge for Southeast Missouri. 
He was a large, portly man with pompous and disagreeable manners, which made him exceedingly unpopular with the bar and the people. And in addition to this, he was overbearing and tyrannical and seemed to take particular pains to make himself obnoxious to suitors, to witnesses, and all others who attended his court. And on top of that, he appointed his son as the clerk of the court too. He was impeached, and then to the surprise of most everybody, John Dillard Cook accepted the appointment from the governor to take his place. So for the next 24 years, John Dillard Cook was the circuit judge. He rode the circuit in that vast circuit that encompassed nearly all of southeast Missouri. Circuit originally as large as I explained, but as the population grew, new counties were established, new circuits were established as well. Each county is its own circuit, and with an overall circuit, all those counties are combined, or circuits are, are combined. So what, what did it mean then for these pioneer judges to ride the circuit? Well, they did so with an entourage. They would go from county seat to county seat to county seat several times a year for their terms of court, they called them, on horseback. Um, the entourage consisted of a court clerk, perhaps, or a court reporter, perhaps, but more importantly, a whole bevy of lawyers, the lawyers who had the cases pending before the, the judge at these uh, county seats within the circuit. Uh, they would put up at uh, inns, taverns, private homes. A lot of them would sleep two in a bed. You've read about that, perhaps. Presumably, the judge slept alone, not with the lawyers. The uh, practice was very similar to uh, what you may have read about in Abraham Lincoln's day, when Lincoln uh, rode the circuit as a uh, lawyer uh, in Illinois in the frontier circuit. That's how it works. The lawyers would get on horseback and they would go from town to town with the judge and they would uh, hold trials uh, and resolve the cases. And uh, in addition, the lawyers while they were there at the county seats, they would sign up new litigants for the next term of court. That's how it worked. In any, in any event, uh, the civil cases that were tried were mainly collection cases. There were no established banking industry at the time, so, so the debts were between individuals. And so there were a lot of, of cases for the collection of debts between individuals. There were foreclosure suits, there were suits over ownership of property and land titles, called suits to quiet title, especially with the Spanish land grants that were all up in the air, land that had been granted to settlers before the Louisiana Purchase. Um, and then there were felony cases too, the, the uh, criminal cases. A prosecuting attorney also rode with his entourage and the prosecutor would, would handle the criminal cases as well as some civil cases his own, on his own too. John Dillard Cook's best friend was a lawyer in Jackson named Greer Davis, Greer W. Davis. He came to Jackson in 1820, just three or four years before Cook got there. He ended up practicing for 57 years in Jackson, Missouri. He was so well thought of, well regarded, at the time that he died at age 79 in 1878, he was regarded as the father of the Missouri Bar. And he was indeed the last of the original pre-statehood pioneer lawyers. He had a magnificent re reputation. I, I read all the nasty stuff about Judge Richard Thomas. Let me read to you about from the reminiscences of John Dillard Cook's best friend, Greer W. Davis. He was always a very successful lawyer, for in addition to his thorough knowledge of the law, he carried with him the most exalted character for honesty and integrity. For nothing did he despise more than trickery or low cunning. No one can say that he was ever guilty of a mean act to win a cause or accomplish an end. He was, moreover, one of the most kind-hearted and benevolent of men, always ready to give to the poor and needy, and cheerfully responding to every call of deserved charity. This goes on for four single-spaced pages. You should read the whole thing sometime. It will make you more proud of lawyers, I think. <laughs> In any event, Greer Davis was John Dillard Cook's best friend, so much so that John Dillard Cook named one of his sons Greer Cook. Now, on the other hand, 
I pity the poor defense lawyer had, had to try a case before Greer Davis and John Dillard Cook because Greer Davis was the prosecuting attorney for 17 of those years that John Dillard Cook rose, uh, rode, the, rode the circuit. So you get the point. <laughs> And so it was that for those uh, 24 years, uh, John Dillard Cook rode from county seat to county seat to county seat, from Perryville to St. Genevieve to Jackson to New Madrid. And later on, he established the circuit courts in these other new counties too, in Mississippi County and Dunklin County in 44. Before that, in Stoddard County in 1836, adding those to the overall circuit. So now you know why we call our judges circuit judges. They literally ride a circuit to this day. I, myself, am a direct judicial descendant of Judge Cook when I was a state court circuit judge in Cape Girardeau County in the late 80s and early 90s, riding the circuit from Jackson to Perryville to Marble Hill in those three counties. The only difference was that I didn't have the exhilarating but exhausting experience of riding on horseback like John Dillard Cook and his lawyers did. Uh, I've only found one really uh, tight anecdote about John Cook's um, service as a circuit judge. This is from the Stoddard County Court history, what they say about Judge Cook. As a lawyer, he ranked high, his decisions as a trial court being seldom reversed on appeal. An ardent fisherman he is reputed to have been. And there's a tradition to the effect that if the sign was right and the weather and season inviting the call of the wild would sometimes so thoroughly master him that he could not refrain from playing hooky from the bench and steal away with hook and line for an afternoon sport. They didn't have golf courses at the time. Thank goodness. So, all the while, John Dillard Cook engaged in a multitude of civic, church, and charitable activities. He was much involved in politics as well. At the time, there was no express prohibition from judges to participate in politics like there is now. So I found articles from the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, in which uh, Judge Cook was prominently involved in politics. For instance, here's an 1821 article in which uh, Cook gave a speech endorsing John Quincy Adams for president against the demonic uh, Democrat Andrew Jackson. Then in 1830, here's a, another article where he presided at a Federalist Party meeting in Cape Girardeau um, opposing uh, the famous Missouri Democrat Senator Thomas Hart Benton. Now, the two leading uh, dominant political parties in Missouri during the 1830s and 1840s were the Democrats and the Whigs. The Whigs, I, I should say, the, the, the Democrats were for expansion of the country, for manifest destiny, uh, but the Whigs were against that. They were feared that if the country expanded too fast, then the issue of slavery would drive apart the country, which eventually happened, of course. And the Whigs generally were anti-slavery, but they weren't abolitionists on the other hand. So then as now, the nation was all stewed up over race relations. Uh, as I mentioned at the 1820 convention, the delegates were overwhelmingly in favor of no restrictions on slavery. Yes, John Dillard Cook was a slaveholder early on. In the census of 1830, he reported two slaves, presumably household servants who had a better time of it than the others. But by the census of 1840 and the census of 1850, he reported no slaves. He had obviously divested himself due to his moral and religious beliefs, and that was the way a lot of people were doing at the time. There was increasing vocal opposition to slavery, but the problem is nobody knew what to do about it. What was an alternative to, to emancipation So there came about an organization called the American Colonization Society. Started in 1816, 1817. It reached its zenith in 1847 with the formal establishment of the country of Liberia. 
The American colonization ceremony was everywhere. It was pervasive across the country, so much so that the vice president of the National American Colonization Ceremonies was no less than Chief Justice John Marshall of the United States Supreme Court. Every state had colonization societies. But this was a big project of the Whigs, although some of the Democrats were, were for it as well, because it was seen as a humane and righteous disposition to, as these blacks became emancipated, freed, to send them back to Africa. That was the progressive opinion at the time. I should say, even the Whigs did not support the ab abolition of slavery, but uh, they were no uh, willing at all to consider blacks as equals. And so the American Colonization Ceremony was this overtly racist organization, pervasive throughout the country. Lincoln was a member in Illinois, if you remember. But it was kind of the progressive idea at the time, with the idea at least free the blacks. In deep in the stacks, of the Missouri uh, of the uh, State Historical Society Library, up on the top shelves somewhere, I found a row of books, the volumes of the African Repository and Colonial Journal. In one of those books is the records, or some of the records, of what was going on in Missouri. The American Colonization Society had all sorts of satellite organizations, including one in St. Louis and several all around the state. And there was, of course, one in Cape Girardeau County. The president, John Dillard Cook. The secretary, his best friend, Greer W. Davis. Four of the vice presidents were preachers, Methodist preachers, Baptist preachers, Presbyterian preachers. That's how it was. Well, all of Cook's involvement in politics and the American Colonization Society, he was first and foremost a Methodist. Have you been to the old McKendry Chapel in Cape Girardeau County? If you will go sometime, I will personally give you the guided tour. Cook and his family early on were members of the McKendry Chapel, which was built and consecrated in 1819, two years before statehood. It is to this day the oldest Protestant church still standing west of the Mississippi River. It is the oldest Methodist church still standing west of West Virginia. It is to this day a sacred and holy place. Beautiful, beautiful. In any event, he was a trustee there, as you would expect. Not only at McKendree Chapel, but also at the church proper in Cape Girardeau and Jackson City and two or three other locations in the region. He was that involved in the Methodist Church at that time. Uh, as a matter of fact, he uh, located his uh, homestead. He owned 115 acres, just about three miles away from the old McKendry Chapel. The point of this is that the story of Methodism and slavery mirrored the debate around the country, except that the debate came to a head with Methodism in America 17 years before the Civil War, because in 1844 and 1845, the Methodist Church split over the issue of slavery. Slavery had always been a theological thorn to the Methodists. Uh, that was an affront to Christian principles, of course. The preachers were prohibited from owning slaves. Not so some of the other congregations. For instance, in Cape Girardeau, Father Pereo, the head of the Catholic Vincentian Seminary, owned 10 slaves. The, a preeminent Baptist preacher, a, a preacher Clark in Cape Girardeau County, he owned 16 slaves. Well, at least the Methodists didn't own slaves. And in fact, in 1819, as uh, the applications were being made for Missouri to uh, come in to the nation, the Methodist preachers went all over the state with petitions trying to sign up people who would uh, support Missouri coming in as a free state. They were unsuccessful, needless to say. The problem with slavery as a practical matter is that it was an untenable solution to deny or revoke church membership to slaveholders. So there were a lot of Methodists who were slaveholders as well as those who advocated against slavery. So both Missouri and down in Cape Girardeau was truly a microcosm of the larger problem. 
Here's how it happened. In 1844, Bishop Andrew George was the Methodist bishop for the state of Georgia. He found himself into a, in a horrible predicament. He owned slaves, first through inheritance, and second through his marriage to his wife. The Methodist church forbade him from owning slaves. But the law in Georgia was an anti-manumission statute. It forbade him from freeing his slaves. So the annual conference of the Methodist church, that's the annual congregation of all the churches met, and they decided that he had to resign or move. And that infuriated all of the Methodists in the southern states. And from that point on, uh, the split started to take place, and as it turned out, every state that eventually became a southern state, a confederate state in the Civil War, they went south to form a new congregation called the Methodist Episcopal Church South, and all the border states did as well. Uh, a vote was taken in the conference in Louisville, Kentucky in May of 1845, whether to go south uh, among these states, whether to go south or to stay with the North Church. The vote was 94 to 3 to go south. All the delegates from Missouri voted to go south. Then Missouri had its own in-house intra-vote among its churches in October of 1845. The vote then was 86 to 14 to go south. Among the 14 preachers to vote no, was the Reverend Nelson Henry, Judge Cook's son-in-law. He was the preacher at Old McKendry Chapel. By way of a local option, if you were a Methodist church that bordered a state that was a free state, you could join either church, the Methodist Church South or the Methodist Episcopal Church North. So McKendry Chapel stayed north uh, through the leadership of Nelson Henry Here's how it played out earlier. The split in that church occurred too. This was in September of 1844 in anticipation of the permanent split and the plan of separation that would, incur, that would occur next year in the conference in Louisville. The old timers recalled that it was a time of heartbreak. Here's what Nelson Hendry did. One Sunday, he set up the chapel so that there were two mourners benches, one for the north and one for the south. And then he called for mourners. And just like the Civil War, even families split up over it. As it turned out, a core group stayed at the Old McKendry Chapel. Among them were John Dillard Cook and his family, founding themselves on the right side of history. The church wasn't to be reconciled until 1939. So why all this talk about the Methodists? In 1860, on the eve of the Civil War, the Combined Methodist Church North and South was the largest non-governmental organization in the nation. It was by far the largest religious denomination, way ahead of the Baptists who were second, and way, way ahead of the Roman Catholics and the Presbyterians who were far behind. One third of every person who affiliated with a established religion, was a Methodist. As a result, the proponents and the opponents of every social, cultural, and political issue of the day sought the favor of the, of the uh, Methodists. So the second most important thing to the Methodists, and this is not exactly on point, but it was about the issue of drinking. There was a need for temperance in a liquor-loving society. Uh, my grandmother in the 1920s was WCTU Women's Christian Temperance Union. Back then, uh, the men's group had an outfit called the Sons of Temperance. Now, this was an issue that both the North and the South folks agreed on, the need for temperance. And indeed, the Baptists and several of the other congregations would join in as members of the Sons of Temperance too, uh, except probably not the Catholics. Uh, I have located a wonderful article in the local paper called The Western Eagle from July 7th, uh, 
1848 reporting on the events of July 4th, the 4th of July celebration, 1848. It was a rally by the Sons of Temperance. They marched, they had a big parade and several hundred people marched throughout the streets of downtown cave, first up to the Baptist church where sermons were delivered and hymns were sung and then they marched downtown and they had a grand uh, a luncheon and more sermons were uh, delivered and the re newspaper reported it this way. They were calculated to encourage the sons in their benevolent exertions to save their fellow beings from ruin. Of course, the results of these and similar efforts were not altogether successful, but maybe some small measure of civility was injected into the community. And of course, John Dillard Cook and Greer Davis were officers in the Sons of Temperance. I say that because there's conflicting evidence about John Dillard's Cook status as a teetotaler. In 1848, that same year, John Cook gave up his duties as circuit judge. He decided to go out and venture into politics again. So he ran for Congress. The congressional district then covered Cape Girardeau all the way up to St. Louis. Uh, he won the Whig nomination by acclamation in May of that year. And at the election, he was soundly defeated, 60-40 throughout the district, 60-40%, even in Cape Girardeau County. Turned out that the incumbent congressman was a Democrat, pro-slavery Democrat. And surely the citizenry knew about uh, John Cook's stand as a member of the Methodist Church of the North. Not to worry. At that same election, Zachary Taylor, the Whig candidate, was elected President of the United States. A few months later, President Zachary Taylor appointed John Dillard Cook to be the United States Attorney for the entire state of Missouri, the Chief Federal Prosecutor for the entire state of Missouri. Now, it was just a small coincidence, you understand, that John Cook's wife, Sarah Taylor Cook, was a first cousin to President Zachary Taylor. In any event, he got the appointment. And for the next four years, he served as the U.S. Attorney, split in time between St. Louis and Cape Girardeau, the last two years, largely in poor health. I found just one article about his service. That was from 1851, and it burnished his credentials as an anti-slavery proponent because he was hired by the African Methodist Episcopal Church in St. Louis to represent them to recover property that had been taken from the by the Methodist Church South people during the plan of separation in 1845. Alas, the case was not resolved until after Judge Cook died in uh, October of 1852. At that time, the tributes poured in, not only from St. Louis and Jefferson City and all over Missouri, but from all over the country. Tributes poured in, his obituaries were printed in, in the papers in Vicksburg, in, in New Orleans, in New York, in Washington, D.C. The St. Louis paper wrote this, Judge Cook enjoyed the entire confidence of the bar and of the circuit in which he presided. He was a sound lawyer and an upright judge. Few men have passed from the stage of action, leaving a less number of enemies than John D. Cook. Now, lest you think that Judge Cook was this grim and proper, pious, staid, church-going, gentleman, country lawyer, he was, in fact, something of a character. In my book, The Reminiscences, here's how they start about John Cook. He was a member of the convention which framed our original state constitution and we are indebted to him for some of its best provisions. And that he was a thorough lawyer and understood the common law of England as well as any divine ever understood the, the Ten Commandments. But then it honed in on the downside. This is his bio in the reminiscences. All he wanted to make him the peer of any Western lawyer was industry and energy in both of which he was greatly wanting. He loved his ease and comfort and cared nothing for office or position. He was not versed in the classics, but was a fine English scholar and well posted in English literature. 
And it said this, Judge Cook was addicted to no bad habits unless laziness is one. And it goes on and on. But then to that sum summary, the writer adds this, Judge Cook was an extremely ugly looking man and what is strange seemed to regard his repulsive looks as a fortunate gift. And then there's this wonderful act, anecdote I have to share. It's not politically correct, but it's part of our history. Judge Cook had an encounter with one Judge Wright of Ohio, both of whom were set aboard a steamer set for St. Louis. At first, Judge Wright struck one of the other passengers as being an uglier man than Cook. Wagers were then taken by the passengers with each judge claiming the honor of being the ugliest. And thereupon, they all proceeded to the bar and over several bottles of champagne drank to each other's health. And it was held without a dissenting opinion after due deliberation that two uglier, uglier men were never born of woman and that should be a judge to pay the cost. At this point in the presentation I gave to my Cape Girardeau off audience, I pointed out several of his direct descendants in the audience. But I was quick to acknowledge that over the generations, those people have come downright handsome. On my left is a portrait of Judge Cook commissioned in 1930. 78 years after his death. It was commissioned by the Supreme Court, and this is a photograph of the portrait that hangs in the Supreme Court Judges Conference Room in Jefferson City. Well, the artist didn't know what he looked like, and certainly didn't have the benefit of the reminiscences of the bench and bar of Missouri. This, my friends, is what's called as revisionist history. This is Judge John D. Cook. This is a daguerreotype, probably from the 1840s, which depicts him much more in the light that all of his contemporaries remember. In any event, as part of that 18, or 1930 uh, reminiscences by the Supreme Court, the commissioning of the portraits of John Cook and others, uh, to honor their service as the pioneer judges. And there was a uh, ceremony held in the unveiling of the portrait. And I'll just close with the first two sentences of the remarks that were made at the closing, or I should say, uh, at the memorial for Judge John D. Cook. This is from the Missouri Supreme Court reports volume 325 in 1930. After life's fitful fever, John Dillard Cook's body has slept well for more than three quarters of a century, but his soul goes marching on in the gentle effulgence. Uh, effulgence, I, I didn't know it either. It means brilliant radiance. The gentle effulgence that emanates from his splendid character grows brighter and brighter as the years go by. So that, my friends, is an abbreviated version of the life and times of Judge John Dillard Cook. Thank you for listening.